We are here today from the Greene County Archives to interview you about your life. So um, we want to just start out with some basic information about your early life. So could you tell, could you state your full name? James H. Martin, that's my official name. What was your date of birth, or what's your date of birth? April 29th, 1921. And where were you born? Portage, Pennsylvania. And your parents' names? Uh, my father was James Antonio Martin. My mother was uh, Beatrice Mobley. Did you have any siblings, or have any siblings? Yeah, I had a sister. Uh, she died about four years ago. Uh, she joined the Marines, and she was during the war at Naval Headquarters, Washington, D.C., in, in the Intelligence Division. And she died a couple years ago, maybe three, four years ago. Sounds impressive. Yeah. So before we get into your actual wartime, can you tell us about your training? Well, I was trained at Tacoa, Georgia. There were four different regiments trained there, but my regiment was the first one, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, G Company, 101st Airborne. And there is a distinction. All the things that they tried out were tried on us. A lot of it was dangerous. We had some people hurt, some people killed. But there was... Uh, General Bradley had uh, gone over and watched the Germans with a parachute operator in the island of the creek. And the Germans won that battle, but they suffered losses pretty heavy. And the old guard in our Army didn't want parachutes. Bradley thought we should have him, so he went to Roosevelt and talked to him. And Roosevelt was Navy, but he was smart enough to know he had to have everybody, so he said, yeah, you can have your parachutes, but I'm going to tell you something. Anything that you want, any material, any personnel you want, anything you want changed or want done, all you have to do is say and it'll be done. And the only person who can change that is me. That was Roosevelt talking. So then uh, Bradley got a guy, a major, uh, I can't remember what his name was now. They sent him out to Missoula, Montana to watch the smoke jumpers, the firefighters. And uh, he was a major. That was Major Lee. Uh, and he came back and said some minor changes, uh, it would work. So that's when they started trying all the different things, jumping us in water, jumping us into uh, forests and things like that. And so a lot of it was gotten rid of because they figured it was too dangerous. But anyway, that was an amazing thing. Major Lee went from major to a two-star general in, in a very short period of time. And then unfortunately for him, he had a heart attack and then uh, we were given, uh, General Taylor came in and was our, the guy that stayed with us all through the war. And they wanted to, Bradley wanted a unit that was tougher than anybody else had or had. And he didn't want old guard people in to mess it up. The old guard people were pretty lazy. 6,500 people signed up. In the middle of July until the 1st of December, we went from 6,500 to 1,650. 
That's how tough the training was. Another thing, generals are not supposed to be in a fight. They're supposed to make up the missions and be the top guys to tell you what to do. But there were two generals that did fight. General Taylor from the 101st, I forget the other guy, he was with the 82nd. And both of them actually led their troops. They shouldn't have done it, but they did. And they did a damn good job of it, too. And of course, we lost a lot of people. <clears throat> but that's what the war is about. Where was your first assignment? Normandy. Normandy. And um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was a. We had to have a base in France to work from. And Normandy is critical for that. And the Germans knew that. So it was a very vicious war. And there was a lot of killing of prisoners. And some of the guys came down in trees and were hanging off 60 feet off the ground. And the Germans cut off their genitals and stuffed them in their mouth and then tortured them and killed them. So some of our guys did some of the same thing, not as bad as they did. But once that starts, it goes across the, the whole area. And what do you think happened to the next German prisoners? And some of those German prisoners, the older ones, the older guys in their 30s, told the, these young guys, you quit this killing prisoners because that's going to come back on us. And of course, they didn't listen, but that's that's the way it happened. We were there 33 days. We went in, General Taylor said, give me three days of hard fighting and you'll be out of it. Why would they say that? Because we're shock troops. We go in, stabilize things, and then the regular troops come in and take over. But they didn't have any more. It was much worse than they thought, so we stayed there 33 days. And nobody complained. When things change, you adapt. All armies do that. And I had people tell me, even today, boy, you must have hated those German soldiers. And I said, no, I didn't hate them. I admired them. And people say, how can you do that? I said, you know, they're professional people. And I said, they're damn good. Don't you think they aren't? And they thought we were a bunch of hot dogs. And of course, after the war, I've been friends with a lot of them, and we joke about it. Hell, they'd been over there in, in Barbarossa. You ever heard that? That was when the Germans had an, um, an agreement that they wouldn't attack the Russians. And then Hitler decided he he thought they were cheating on him, so he tore up that agreement, and all those people in this Barbarossa started going towards Stalingrad. They got all those to Stalingrad, and of course, what happened? The Germans were still using horses <coughs> for transport, and the more the closer they got to Stalingrad, the longer their supply lines was. And they were 500 miles, and then the weather went bad, and they got within uh, a few miles of Stalingrad. And, and Hitler said, anybody that feels he can't do that, will shoot him. So behind each German group was a guy who's job was to shoot any soldier that he thought was going to quit. How would you like to do that? So anyway, we're lucky that that happened at that time. 
Because if we had all those people down on us in Normandy, we probably couldn't have won that war. But that's the way things happen. Did you have any kind of friendships or camaraderie that you formed during the service? Yes, there were about 50 of us that got together after the war, and uh, we went to reunions all over the country. And that's another thing. After the war was over, 50% of the marriages that were made were divorced within that first year. And then after that, everybody stayed together until the end. And so there's only a, <clears throat> I'm told now I'm the, the last original Tacoa person still alive. Now stop thinking that. When World War I was over, there was 400,000 people in service. When World War II started, that's how many people we had. Two years later, we had 16 million people in service. I was told recently that, well, the government puts the figures out uh, every week on how many are left percentage. I'm told there's only about 1% of those 16 million still alive, and I'm going to have to be one of them. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't do anything special. I just lived. i tell you something else. Mm -hmm. My wife taught me this. I was pretty hard on people after the war, pretty negative. She said, Jim, you got to stop that. Be optimistic. Don't say bad things about anybody. Even the worst of people, you can find something to say good about them. If you don't think you can do it, don't say it. And I've tried to live that way all the time now. And I've helped a lot of people. And people say, where well, you get the money to do it? I said, well, you know. Don and I worked hard to get enough money so we wouldn't have to go in a nursing home after the war was over. That's where the money came from for the things I do today. And yes, I help a lot of people. And most people don't know it. And I don't want them to know it. But that's, I found that's really good. It's amazing. It, if you do good things, good things come back to you automatically. So when your wartime service, did you do anything that you found for good luck, that you did for good luck? There's no luck in, in the service. There's no luck at all. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. Don't depend on luck. Do you recall the day service ended for you when you... Yes, I do. Could you tell us a little bit about it? There was no joy, no parties or anything. We are just glad that it was over and we are still alive. Another thing to think about it too. In Normandy, we were all gung ho about going to go over and kill all the Germans. We went to Holland. It wasn't that way. We knew what we were going into. Nobody's bragging about anything. I've been to Holland four different times. I've made two parachutes, jumped over there for them. Because they're going to make a well, all the day they have celebrations about Normandy. It's a tourist spot now, and that's what they wanted, and that's why I made over there and made that jump. Now they've got a tourist spot over there, and that's another thing that always has irked me. 
the British soldiers that fought over there on the ground, their government didn't do a damn thing for them. You see a German or a British soldier, he's got all the little things hanging on him. That's just give them. We used to joke about us. They give them the damn little things hanging on them. Don't mean anything. And our people gave us money. And I want to tell you something else. I didn't realize how much the government was going to do for us by having this health thing we have, Veterans Administration. It's the most wonderful thing that ever happened. And everybody out there, and a lot of them are veterans too, but everybody out there is wonderful. You go out there and now it's like going to a reunion. Everybody's good to us. How did you readjust to civilian life? How did I? Readjust to civilian life. I had a hard time, but it wasn't for the service. It's the way we were treated when we came back. The people I worked with and the companies I worked with were all, every one of them, almost everyone had a little black market thing going on and made a lot of money. And one friend of mine, his name was Baker, and he showed me his bank book. He had, while I was gone, he had $50,000 in the bank while I was gone. Now, at that time, that was a hell of a lot of money. And I didn't begrudge him that at all. That didn't bother me. Money never did bother me. Never was anything to me isn't today. Money is to be used to help somebody else. I get calls from grandchildren, great-grandchildren who wants to know what their person did. And I still remember all that. They said, how can you remember all that? I said, I don't know. That's the way it is. And I said, a lot of people around here wish I didn't have such a good memory. One woman, Donna Allen, her mother was a, a hard German. And her father came into our outfit shortly before we went into Normandy wasn't in there very long, and nobody remembered him. His name was Talhelm. And she saw me at a reading <coughs> and got talking to me, and she was 16 months old, and he sent her the stuff he had got while we were in training, different things, uh, awards and medals and things. And her grandmother learned all that stuff. She couldn't talk. Nobody, since he came in at the late time, nobody knew anything about him. And then later she got married and uh, Mark Bando, who was an unofficial historian of the 101st, he sent down a jumpsuit and boots I, I was her best man going when she got married. And she, she called me just recently and talked about coming back over again. She'd been over here several times. And uh, there's a place over in Yellow Springs had a restaurant called The Winds. She said, I work there, I'm a waitress there, and I want you to talk to her. This friend of mine said, I'm leaving this week to go out to meet up with uh, Eric. He's one of the producers. And he said, I want you to call him and see what you think of that film they made, Band of Brothers. So I called him. There were two Eric's, and I don't know which one I talked to. But Talked in for one side, and that son of a gun. One of the scenes to put in there showed one of our guys on top of a one of the civilian girls over there having sex and laughing. I told him, "What the hell is the matter with you? 
these people lived under the Germans for four damn years. You can't think <coughs> she's going to have sex with somebody out in the battlefield. And he got mad as the devil and he said, well, but that's, uh, that's license. We can do that to make it more dynamic. And I said, you better get that the hell out of there. And my God, they did take it out. I said, <coughs> You could have them going in a barn, shutting the door, and then think what they want, but don't put that out there. It doesn't happen that way. How do you think the military service affected your life? And what do you think are some lessons that you learned? Well, it changed me a lot. Uh, for quite a while, people get killed in auto accidents and things like that. It didn't bother me at all. And finally, I Again, I said, you know what? These people carry on about those things, but here they are with no training at all. Never one instance, a 20-year-old girl going to work, and there's two women out there screaming about their baby was in there. And they got out of the car; it was on fire, and this young woman, 20 years old, went over there and and got that baby out safely. The car blew up, knocked her down, but the baby was saved. Now to me, that's a hero. Mm -hmm. That's a word that's way overused. People are talking about us being heroes. No, let me tell you something. When you volunteer for something, you train for it, you get paid for it, you're not a hero. That's what you're expected to do. And I also have told the people around here the same thing. And I said, let me tell you something. These people, the first responders here now, are as important to this country as we were then. And you don't think much about those responders until you need them. But my God, they're there taking care of you. And I've said even recently, I don't think, I'm not sure, if I were a fireman, if I, ha I would have the courage to go into a burning building and look for somebody. I said, not very long ago, two of them went in there and fell through the floor of the basement, and then there was no way they could, could get out. They didn't say anything. I said, that's a hero. And a policeman stopped a, a car at three in the morning with four dingy looking people in it. You think he doesn't have courage? You're damn right he does. And so I look at it differently now. Do you have a message you think you would like to leave for future generations? Yes, I do. Uh, one gathering. They asked me to swear in some guys to go to the Army. That's about 10 years ago. And I swore them in. And that's unusual, too. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. You think this is wonderful going in, you're going to hate it for a while. Hmm. And when you get out and get as old as I am, you know, Look back on that as one of the best times of your life. People said, well, why, why is that? I said, look at it. I can tell you from my experience, guys who came into our unit said they never had such good food. As bad as it was, it was better than what they had. I said, you had your clothes, your shoes, your uniform. You know, you had no social obligations whatsoever. You're bound by what the army did. And you went out and said, but in life, you come back in after you're out, then you do have social obligations. There are certain things you can't do. You have to watch what you say and what you do. And that's the way life is. Nothing happens. I love.
what would you like people to know or remember about your story? I don't care about him uh, remembering me. It is important. But just remember that an awful lot of people gave their time and their lives so that we could live free. And those people, that for every one of us that were in heavy combat, there's eight or nine guys behind us that left their home, drove trucks, brought ammunition, supplies, so that we could do what we did. And they're as important as we are. A lot of people don't look at that way, but I do. And that's, that's very important. Would you do it again? Absolutely. Don't go into war unless you intend to win. And we don't do that now. And don't keep making threats and do nothing. That's why every damn little kook in the world, all these little countries, runs us down because they know we're going to do anything. And you know, the thing that's most important is to remember always to be optimistic and remember this. Go back to what it was when I grew up. If you don't work, you don't eat. Yes, and people go to the government and ask for something, and they'll set up a program. And you know what? It's getting to the point now there's going to be more people in the government programs than there are working, and that isn't going to work very long. That's going to have to change. Be extremely thankful that you live in this country. And I just saw a thing on television. 400 million people around the world want to come to the United States. Why? I'll tell you why. This is the freest country in the whole damn world. What do you wish more people knew about veterans? What you should know and appreciate is without the veterans, we wouldn't have a country. Is there anything that you would like to add that we haven't covered so far? About your life, your experience? Well, Don and I had some really tough times, and my son made a statement not too long ago. He said, yeah, and he had a lot of luck. And I said, yes, Roger, it was a lot of luck. luck. Most of it bad, but I said, we didn't complain. In the time when I grew up and you were young, Everybody took what came, and nobody complained. Nobody thought that somebody else would take care of you. It just didn't happen that way. And we've gotten away from that now. That's another thing. Everybody said the big companies are, are raping the people, making slaves. And I told him recently, I said, you know what? When they hire somebody, they hire them for a reason to feel, make the company better. And if those companies didn't exist, how the hell do you think you'd live? We still go around and around about that. That's another thing. You start companies, when they start giving people these things, they call them benefits. And now they call them entitlements. You're not entitled to a damn thing except to go out and get a job and support yourself and help your neighbor. We've got away from a lot of that. Yeah, when the war was over, <laughs> in a residential hotel up there in Purchase Garden on the second floor. 
and I picked up a 177 air rifle, one of those that the more, more you pump it, the harder it shoots. And then we, the war had been over for a week or so, and some of the German soldiers were coming down out of the hills. They'd head up there and finally decided to come out. And these, these girls were, women were hugging them. And I was shooting them in the rear end. And a runner came up, hey Martin, the colonel wants to see you. He said, bring that damn near rifle with you. Now you see, he assumed it was me, and he was right. <laughs> he said, you know what? I got enough damn trouble without you doing that. I got sick woman over there now, getting the slug taken out of the rear end. He didn't give me the air rifle back either. My wife and I built this house. Just the two of us. Mm -hmm. People said, oh, you mean to hire somebody and tell them how to do it? And I know there's other people around here, not the, uh, I'm the only airborne person, but others did. And then we had steel beams to put up. Uh, we'd help each other back and forth that way. But I said, I drove every damn nail to this house. We had one child when I lived in the garage. It was a small garage, you can see the door. But then we got to the point where we had the basement covered over, and we had a shower and a toilet, and we also ate in there, and that's still there. And I took them over and pulled the thing off under the front porch. That's all there. And I said, we raise chickens in there, start them early. And that's the way we did things. And I said, one time we got some chickens real early. They came earlier than we thought they would. They came in the mail. Chickens can go three days before they have to be fed. They're fitting on the yolk. We had 25 chickens. I put a little shelf and a little pen in the corner of the room and we had those chickens in there for about two weeks before it got warm enough to let them out. And then when we were in the basement, I put a heat elevator in and boy that really put the heat out and could get all this wood. We used a cross cut and she and I used a cross cut. We'd spend evenings after the meal um, using the cross cut, and the next week I, I would be splitting it and I'd take it in and sell it. And I was selling it for $20 a cord. I told that one moment, I said, no, I'll be back to give you the rest tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening. And she said, Well, I only ordered one cord. I said, What do you mean? And she said, I've been buying a bit of corn, they'd bring me a, a, one load. I said, yeah, he's cheating you too. And that went on quite a lot. And then as a result of that, the state come on and put uh, regulation on what kind of wood you'd sell and uh, how it had to be sold. And then when we were in there uh, that winter with it covered over, I took some 2 by 12s in one corner. I had a place of about 8 by 10. I put a couple of loads of sand in there, and the kids had a place to play all winter in the sand. They said, well, said, my God, you're crazy as hell. I said, no, those kids had a heck of a time all winter in there. We do all kinds of things. And then I was telling somebody that we came out from the shop to hunt rabbits, telling about flying squirrels. 
fast you want to see them. They didn't believe me. I said, they don't fly, they glide. I went out and took a stick and about three inches in diameter and whacked that thing and there was a big hole in it about 30 feet up and about 50 of those flying squirrels came out. And then one guy picked up a stick and, and hit one and it fell down. He put it in his hunting jacket and went in there and Donna had made uh, some big soft pretzels and she had some cider and fixed a little meal and all of a sudden that damn thing must have been hit in the nose or something. Got out of his pocket and started running around in there and we didn't put it out because I said, I think we'll find this thing back now. The others went back and I said, it's it's too late for you to go. They're all in there and it'll be in. So we kept that in all night. We had a fox, pet fox. It was in there and it stayed with us, slept on the bed. And we had skunks. And some of the people called to say, hey, there's a bunch of little skunks running around here. The mother got killed by it. What can you do about it? Of course, the law said you, you you couldn't do that. Just let them die. And I said, I don't give a damn what the law is. I'm not going to let them die. And then we put that island out there. That's where the geese came in and, and uh, raised their, uh, their young all the time. And I said, I put that so people, foxes and other things, couldn't come in and get their babies. And then I put the put those little skunks out there too, and then they got big enough. I took them and, and let them run loose. And, they, and of course we had the doors open, and we were living in the basement. And the uh, game warden, whose name was Keller, and he was pretty tough too. And he came over. He said, "Now I understand you've got." some skunks here. I said, yeah, I got skunks. He said, show me where you keep them. I said, well, in the house. He said, you're kidding. I said, no. Didn't you see them come out there? He said, I'm going to tell you something. You're supposed to let them die. You're not supposed to bother them. I said, I don't care what you say. You put me in jail for one. When I see them and people call me and say they've got some skunks and then it got so Don and I drive along, we'd send along tied the road and I'd stop and she'd get out and run and pick them up. Of course we smelled like it because they were upset then. But those we had in the house, there's a guy that made a motion picture that lived up the street. I, I heard somebody say they, they had that, and I've never seen it. But hell, they ran all over the place in there. We never had any trouble, as long as you don't bother them. And they, they're very affectionate. They'll snuggle up to you in your bed, <laughs> and make nice little sounds. That's, that's what my kids had. Now. After the war, people decided that business should be separate from where people lived. And when we grew up, people lived, went to work at a place, they lived right around it. And they decided that shouldn't happen. And now kids don't even know what, they, what their fathers do. You know, the thing that's most important is to remember always to be optimistic and remember this. Live every second of the week, every day. Don't sit around and feel sorry. Be thankful you have it because you don't know what's happened. I've had two boys got killed in an airplane crash, both young. They never expected to go when they're 32, 34 years old. You just don't know that. 